A very good morning to all of you. I welcome you all to the ICANN initiative, the Hindu and Indian Express analysis. So we will start today with the story of the day. Uh, I'll be telling the story of a sannyasi and his disciple. Uh, yesterday I was interacting with uh, someone in the evening and that person told me a very interesting story which I thought was very relevant uh, in today's context. So the story goes like this. Um, a sannyasi and his disciple are... Uh, and his shishya are they they are just walking in a jungle so when they are walking a lady comes to them she is a young beautiful lady and then she tells the sanyasi that uh, uh, see i'm not able to walk and i'll not be able to cross this river which is ahead of us so will you please help me in crossing this river then sanyasi says uh, definitely why not and uh, sanyasi lifts the lady and then he helps her cross the river and then she drops her on the other bank of the river. And after that, the sannyasi and the shishya, they continue their walk. So shishya starts thinking that um, he is a sannyasi, his guru is a sannyasi, but still uh, he uh, touched a young, beautiful lady. So he had all these thoughts running. He thought for himself, should I ask guru uh, that how come you did like this? Or should I wait for him only to uh, come out with an answer? What should I do? So he was thinking all the way to the ashram. So finally, after 20 minutes of thinking, he decides to ask uh, the sannyasi, his guru. He asks, uh, Guruji, how come you are being a sannyasi? You are so such pure, pious. And how come you touched a young, beautiful lady uh, and you made her cross the river? So how that matches with your sannyasi qualities? So at that time, uh, sannyasi says that uh, I dropped the lady at the uh, other bank of the river, but you have carried the lady till the gate of the ashram. So this is what is happening in today's lives with all of us. This particular story I chose particularly in the context of um, the number of suicides that we are see, uh, seeing among the youngsters and also the successful celebrities that we are seeing that we carry unnecessary unwanted things in our mind which actually we should have dropped off much much before. So we are worried about a lot of things, we are tensed about a lot of things, we, are, we have forgotten to live in the present. So rather we carry so many things from our past to the future and we worry about it unnecessarily. We come under the pressure and we succumb to this pressure eventually. So this is what we should not do. Whenever something is over, just drop it then and there and then move forward in life. So uh, we should always learn to be in the present and then enjoy that present. So just being a prisoner of the past is of no use and carrying these unnecessary thoughts and pressurizing oneself so much is again of no use. So with this, we will start with the first topic of the day. It's an issue related to the environment. So this is about the hubali Ankola railway line, uh, which has been now, uh, consent has been given by the state government for developing this. So now this project was initially rejected by the State Wildlife Board. It was also rejected by the National Tiger Conservation Authority saying that first of all it is ecologically not good and secondly even this project does not have the commercial and the economic merit also. Why? Because the mining activities in the region have already declined and also whatever mining activities are happening there is already a good port connectivity uh, connectivity from the mining area till the port on both the coasts so there is a connectivity already that is there so this project does not have to uh, be approved because mining activity is declining and also there is already connectivity of the port uh, of the mining areas to the ports on both the coasts so ntca says that not just environmentally but even uh, economically and commercially speaking this project is not viable and environmentally speaking it is this whole project is going to go through the region which has very rich flora and fauna and also it is going to lead to the destruction of nearly three lakh uh, trees so this is a huge loss of the green cover uh, in the state of Karnataka so um, as such whole India so this three lakh uh, trees will be lost because of this so this shows how environmentally destructive the project is but yet the state government is pushing for this project and it has given the approval for this project a go ahead for this project irrespective of a rejection by the state wildlife board and a rejection by the NTCA and even an expert committee of the central board for wildlife had also rejected this project 
So this is a classic example of environment versus development debate, which can be used as an example. Now we'll the next topic, which is India-Nepal relations. So there is nothing much in this um, uh, topic. We have already discussed the topic in detail, what is the border issue and all that. So the only uh, new development that has happened is now Nepal has um, now enacted a constitutional amendment act. So according to this amendment, um, three parts that is uh, Lipulek, Kalapani and Limpiadura. So these three parts, uh, these three areas will now be part of Nepal according to this constitutional amendment act. So these three are Nepal territories according to the amendment act. So this is a, a progress that has happened in the India-Nepal border relations. So that is the latest that you have to remember. So next is regarding the center state fiscal relations. So this basically had two articles uh, which were important. So in the first article it spoke about um, the GST issue between the center and the states. So recently a GST council meeting was held. So uh, usually what happens, um, uh, we have to file the uh, GST returns, that is uh, the traders will have to find the file the GST returns on time. So if they are not filing, they are liable to pay uh, late fees and interest also. But it was decided in the GST council that let's relax this late fees and the interest payable because definitely uh, due to COVID, businesses are already facing a lot of stress. So let them not come under further stress. Let's relax these late fees and the interest payable. So this was relaxed in the GST council. So as a result of so many relaxations that have been given during the COVID, uh, the GST collections of March itself had come down to nearly 97,500 crore rupees. Before March for the previous four months, that is February, January, December and November, the collections were more than 1 lakh crore per month. So there is a fall in the uh, GST collection that is happening. So this was in the case of March itself. So in April, May, when the figures do come out, they will show a further fall in the GST collections. So this is directly having an impact on the uh, state finances because the center is first of all not able to uh, share the GST collections with the state. And the center was also supposed to give GST compensation to the state. So when the GST Act was enacted, it was agreed that the states may face revenue shortages in the first five years till the tax regime stabilizes. So for the first five years, uh, in order to ensure that the states do not face any shortage in the revenue, they will be given a compensation for the five years. So this was decided. But now because of the fiscal stress uh, that the center itself is facing, it's not able to give the GST compensation dues to the states. So this has led to development of some fiscal tensions between the center and the state. So now we'll see the second article which I was talking about. Uh, this was also on the center state fiscal relations. So whenever we talk of center state fiscal relations, you can divide that into uh, four parts. One is regarding the debt. Next is the state borrowings. Uh, next is uh, the tax devolution to the states and then next is the GST compensation. So these are the four broad areas under which the center and the states are facing fiscal issues. So first we will talk about debt. So in the case of debt, uh, the Fiscal Responsibility and Budget Management Act. So there was a review committee to review this act. That review committee had recommended that the uh, we have to bring down the government debt to 60% of the GDP by 2022 but in previous uh, weeks class we saw how the uh, public debt is now 72 or 74 percent and it is going to increase to more than 80 percent looking at the current borrowing levels so the frbm review committee recommendation that it should be within 60 percent of gdp by 2020 that is very unlikely to materialize now so in this case, uh, what will be the role of the Finance Commission? Now, Finance Commission can lay out a path, a new path for both the center and the states that they can follow to consolidate the debt. So it can lay a new path for the center and the states to follow for consolidating their debt. So this is a, a role of the Finance Commission in this regard. And this is the issue about debt. So next we come to the state borrowings. So when we come to state borrowings again, uh, the states earlier 
were facing a lot of constraints when it comes to borrowing so they did not enjoy that freedom uh, to borrow on their own so now the center because of the covid crisis had uh, eased this state's budget constraint and it has eased the uh, borrowings by the state but however uh, even when the states were allowed to borrow funds uh, it was made conditional that only when the states implement some reforms which the center has told only then they will be allowed to borrow more this year so therefore there has been a liberalization when it comes to borrowing by the states but however uh, this crisis is going to span for more than one year uh, so therefore the states will also want uh, to have more finances the next and next year as well to tackle and completely overcome this crisis so in this case will this liberalization be there even for the next or the coming years so in this case again the role of finance commission comes that finance commission can ascertain the status in the states uh, how much finances they need to tackle this crisis and based on that based on a criteria it can say uh, it can fix the limits for borrowing by the state and the center so this will also be uh, another role of finance commission now third uh, issue that the center and the states are facing is a gst compensation which i have already explained so now the gst dues have uh, also come below 1 lakh crore uh, which before march was more than 1 lakh crore and uh, therefore uh, nirmala sitaraman uh, our finance minister has also told in the uh, gst council meeting that uh, the indirect tax collection uh, per month after march has been just nearly 45 percentage of the total indirect tax collections uh, that would we that we would have otherwise had so this collection is a very low amount so uh, when uh, amount getting collected itself is low then how far the center will be able to compensate the states is another issue and the second is that because of the financial uh, crisis or rather the difficult financial situations that the states are facing uh, because of the covid crisis the states are also demanding that this gst compensation which was uh, to be provided to the states for five years uh, since the enactment of the gst act the states wanted uh, this extended uh, compensation period because of the revenue losses that they are now facing now in this regard again the finance commission may be able to ascertain whether this extension of the compensation is feasible whether it will help the states and uh, whether such a extension of the compensation is possible for the center to bear so all that the finance commission can ascertain in this case so this is another role that the finance commission can play so the next uh, uh, issue between the center and the state's fiscal relations is a tax devolution so when we talk of the 14th finance commission it had told that 32 percentage of the uh, central pool of the taxes divisible pool of taxes should be assigned to the states so uh, sorry 42 percent of the total devolution so now in this case uh, how far the uh, center will be able to devolve um, 42 or now 41 or more than 40 percent of the finances to the states whether such devolution is possible given the current crisis is another issue now again the 15th finance com uh, commission in this regard will have to play the role of um, balancing this fiscal federalism so it is a balancing wheel in the it's a balancing wheel in the fiscal federalism so it has to uh, play this sensitive role and try to balance the fiscal interests of the center and the states so with this uh, we are done with the fiscal issues between center and the states next is the issues related to equality so in this particular article there wasn't anything concrete but few um, notable things are scattered here and there which may be important while um, adding more value to your answers the first thing is about um, what Irfan Patan, the former Indian cricketer, had to say. So he said that um, racism in India goes beyond the color of our skin also. For instance, uh, whenever a person goes and asks for renting a house or buying a house, then uh, whether that person will be given the house on rent or to buy will depend upon the faith of the person. So many info embargoes are enforced on people who want to buy the house based on their faith. So this is a, uh, this shows how much inequality is present in India. The second thing it talks about is um, in South Africa, there is a, in, in spite of the South African constitution itself guaranteeing that there will be a right to equality. In spite of that, South Africa has a comprehensive legislation 
uh, which defines inequality and then which um, uh, it is basically an anti-discrimination law. So it prohibits any unfair discrimination, not just by the government, but also by the private individuals. Now, this is very important because the constitution says that uh, there must not be any discrimination, but this is essentially uh, it says that the state should not discriminate against the citizens on the basis of, uh, say, gender or religion, sex, place of birth, etc. So this is covered in Article 15 of the Constitution. So this is telling that the states should not discriminate, but nothing is preventing from the private individuals from discriminating against another person. So that is the reason why we need a comprehensive legislation which uh, targets or which tackles even those instances where the private individuals are discriminating against other individuals. So this is very important. So now in this regard, um, a bill was earlier introduced by Shashi Tharoor in the parliament. It was a private member bill that was introduced in 2017. There was another bill that was introduced by Center for Law and Policy Research. So this was done in 2019. So these attempts have not borne fruit till now, but they are very important because uh, they take uh, cognizance of the civil liberties and that uh, the fact that an individual could also be discriminated by the, another individual and not just by the state. So these laws, uh, we will have to go more forward on this if we have to have a rule of law in the country and rule of law is a basic feature of the constitution. So this was the whole essence of this article. Now uh, you may have a question saying, uh, uh, sh do our country need a special anti-discrimination law? So something like that you can have a uh, question. So the next thing is related to higher education and skilling. So this particular article uh, basically uh, starts with uh, what is called as a skill university. So skill universities are those universities uh, uh, I'll explain what skill university is. Skill university has basically four components or the four characteristics. The first is the role of employers. So the potential future employers will have a very big role to play in a skill university. So these employers are going to decide what should be the governance in these universities, who should be the faculty and what should be the curriculum that the students in these universities are studying and what should be the pedagogy. So all of these things are decided by the employers so that those students who are studying in these skilled universities, when they graduate finally out of the university, they are ready for employment by these employers. So that is one uh, basic thing. Second is, it's on the nature of the classrooms. So skill university concept, it uh, recognizes the fact that just on campus learning, that is theoretical learning will not suffice. Because when uh, the student completes the graduation and needs to take up a job, some amount of practical exposure is absolutely essential. So for this, uh, it recognizes that apart from on-campus online learning, we also need on-site learning and we need on-the-job learning. Okay, we need on-the-job learning as well. So this is another thing that is focused by the Skill University. The third thing is regarding the flexibility uh, that this offers so you can choose whatever you want like it can be certificate course it can be diploma advanced diploma or degree so that is another thing next is related to the funding so here as the employers are deciding most of the things uh, even the funding is also given by the employers so this can be the employers the corporate social responsibility funds the csr funds and loans so they will contribute the majority of funding in these skill universities for instance, compare uh, Delhi University with that of Gujarat Skill University. So both have a budget of nearly 700 crore plus is the annual cost of this. But um, in the case of uh, uh, Gujarat Skill University, 97% of the budget will come from the employers. So but in the case of DU, 97% of the uh, budget comes from the government itself government as in it is a taxpayer's money that uh, is that the du is funded by but in the case of gujarat 97 percent funds come from the employers only so this shows that how the employers are also willing to uh, fund these universities if they know that those students who are passing out of these universities will be ready for employment by these employers so 
but however the article also focuses on several issues which are present in the higher education system particularly when it comes to the uh, gap of uh, skilling in the uh, students so the first issue is regarding the employability so the article gives good amount of statistics it says that nearly 60% of korea's taxi drivers are graduates 31% of united states retail checkout clerks are graduates and 15% in india's high end security guards are graduates so this shows that those who are graduates are are uh, getting employed as taxi drivers as clerks and security guards which means whenever they get graduated they are not finding any job because whatever they have learned in the graduation is not something which the uh, actual job wants so there is a that gap that has been created so the employability is very low in india so uh, whatever syllabus is there in the graduation that doesn't suit the industry needs so this is the first important issue the second is related to the funding in the case of funding first of all there is a scarcity of uh, funds when it comes to these universities and also nearly uh, those students who take uh, up their studies in the universities because if they belong to the poor uh, backgrounds they may also end up taking educational loans so out of 1.5 trillion educational loans nearly 50% of this has become non performing assets in the banks why because when these children who are taking the educational loans tomorrow if then if they become employable and if they get a job they will get salary and they will be able to pay back their loans but these um, students are taking the educational loans but they are not uh, getting any job after the graduation so they are unable to pay back their educational loans and that is why 50% of the loans that the students have got have turned into non performing assets so this is the issue related to funding the third thing is that um, if you look at the inclusiveness so there is it is also said that there is a block broken inclusiveness when it comes to these universities because uh, they favor the privileged ones the urban male and who are studying full time but today students are female they are poor they are studying part time they are older they are from rural background so this inclusiveness is also missing in the uh, universities that is another problem that uh, has been mentioned uh, so the fourth one is the flexibility in the case of flexibility it means that there has to be some amount of flexibility because um, these learners who are learning in the university and they will have to have some exposure of the uh, on the job or what is happening on site so that practical exposure should also be there but the curricular the syllabus is uh, rigid and it focuses more more on the theoretical learning in the classroom and less on the uh, on the job or on site learning so this flexibility is also not there these are some of the important issues when it comes to the universities or higher education so yesterday's question also i had asked uh, what are the issues with the higher educational institutions so all of these things can form a good part of your answer for uh, yesterday's question uh, the article also talks about so if this is the case of the universities then what is it that we can do see first of all we must understand the importance of these skill universities they are scalable they are sustainable and they are affordable vehicle for higher education so for this the first thing that we must do is the regulatory uh, issue so the economic survey has also talked about a regulatory cholesterol so a lot of regulations are there under the ugc act and the ugc act needs to be amended for bringing about a regulatory change so uh, the second thing that we need to do is we need to treat um, as i said the classroom can be either on campus or it can be on job so these two need to be treated on an equal basis and they must be given an equal importance so apart from the theory based learning that happens in the classrooms focus must also be there on on the job training the third thing we must uh, is do is apprenticeship so apprenticeship should receive more importance and more emphasis um, only then the students will be able uh, they will be exposed to the needs of the industry and they will uh direct their learning with the uh, needs of the industry so apprenticeship programs should be encouraged the next thing that uh, we need to do is uh, now what happens is the teacher who teaches in the university will are they are required to have some qualifications 
but these teachers they themselves do not have any industry exposure so whatever they are going to teach in the universities they may not be aligned with the industry needs because they themselves don't have any industry exposure but there will be few people who have good amount of industry exposure so they must also be uh, as, uh, they must also be treated as teachers and they must be considered qualified for teaching in the universities so that means we need to recognize industry experience as a teaching qualification so industry experience will have to be counted while uh, deciding upon the teachers so that the teachers will also have an exposure to the uh, industry and they can uh, connect the theory and the practical knowledge and uh, the next thing we have to do is uh, we can come out with more internships and uh, any work based learning should be there internships more evaluated internship should be there then uh, we have to also teach life skills to the students that is again very important so these are some of the important areas where the reforms are needed so now uh, we saw what is the importance of skill universities then uh, what are all the issues and what can be done for this now we'll go uh, we'll discuss yesterday's question so the question was uh, what issues uh, the higher educational institutions in india are facing so in this regard um, uh, you can come out with a lot of issues but if you uh, base your issue on the recommendations of some committees in the past that have been set up for this so that will be more authentic and it will add more value to your answer for instance in the year 2017 a standing committee of hrd that was chaired by satyanarayan jatia was um, set up and it had submitted a report on uh, issues and challenges before higher educational sector in india so this report came out with a number of observations regarding the higher educational institutions and also made several recommendations so you can quote these issues um, so that they are more uh, stronger and they have more value in them for instance uh, the first issue will be the shortage of resources so shortage of mainly financial resources for instance uh, the ugc grants are being provided to the state and the central universities but this uh, ugc budget is mostly utilized 65% of the ugc budget it's coast for the central universities while only 35% is left for the state universities but we must remember that bulk of the admissions are happening in the higher education uh, by in the state universities and their affiliated colleges so the state universities are starved of funds in this regard so the committee has recommended that um, we need to find out various ways of mobilizing funds for the state universities for instance a contribution from the alumni contribution through the endowments and the contribution from the industry because industry academia linkage is very important so this is on a financial issue next is regarding the teachers issue so in this regard according to ugc data itself uh, in our country there is uh, for the professor post there is a 35 percentage uh, shortage and for associate professor post there is a 46 percentage shortage so this is a huge number uh, when it comes to the uh, teaching post so this will have to be filled uh, so that the teaching is not hampered in the universities even if you talk of the pupil to teacher ratio so even in that uh, india though it has a 30 is to 1 which is a pupil to teacher ratio and it is not that bad but if you compare the international levels for instance in usa it is 12.5 is to 1 in china also it is 19.5 is to 1 so we need to reduce this also so the, we need additional teachers and we also first of all need to bring a uh, bridge this vacancy that is uh, there so that is another important uh, issue the third uh, issue is that uh, for the teachers there is no accountability so accountability is very important so there is no mechanism to enforce uh, or to ensure accountability of of the teachers there is nothing to see how these professors are performing in the universities and the colleges so uh, in the foreign universities there will always be a component to measure the performance of the professors so even in india there must be performance audit uh, which uh, can be conducted and uh, where the uh, professors are evaluated by their peers and students so that will set a, an accountability on the part of the professors uh, regarding their performance so this is a, another recommendation that the committee had given and uh, there are several other uh, observations also that uh, 
when it comes to the higher educational institutions. So yesterday we saw that the cross enrollment ratio in India as of 2017-18 is 25 point something. So this is low compared to the other uh, developed and uh, major developing countries. So the enrollment ratio itself is less. Then secondly, even on the equity aspect, even on the equity aspect, if you see that uh, among the in the cross enrollment ratio, uh, different sections of society and the way they are represented. So may, females are less compared to the males and uh, the SCSD's SC for instance is just 21.8 percentage represented and ST is just 16 percent represented. So there is definitely this low representation also. And thirdly, when it comes to the colleges uh, themselves or the universities uh, and the colleges themselves, here again there is a, a regional distribution is also skewed in this case. So for instance, the college density. College density means the number of colleges per lakh eligible population. So this college density is 7 in the case of Bihar, that is 7 colleges per lakh population, but it is 59 in the case of Telangana. So there is a huge amount of uh, regional disparity that is seen in the availability of quality colleges. So this again will have to be bridge. So wherein we need to bring in more quality colleges in those areas which have been underserved. So this is important and even you can talk about the curriculum. Curriculum is again more outdated, that it is rigid and uh, industry academia interaction is not there before the curriculum is fixed. So that is why many of the uh, graduates are not employable. So this is another thing. Then you can also talk about the pedagogy and the assessment. So whenever tests are conducted, they are based on uh, just the inputs that the teacher gives in the classroom and then they are based on rote learning. So the students analytical skills, their critical thinking, their reasoning and problem solving skills are not tested in this uh, type of assessment. So that is one thing. And then there are several bogus universities that have come up which are cheating the children. Then uh, universities and colleges is also one uh, way where uh, the black money is also getting uh, involved. High management fees are being levied. So all of these things you can uh, mention. And then uh, now you can talk about the rankings that have recently come, that how they are poor on the ranking uh, in, about international faculty and international students are not there. So all of these things you can tell and how uh, the today's four issues that we discussed regarding employability, regarding financing, so all that uh, we can discuss and uh, the amount of research also, the research and development in the universities is again not up to the industry standards and the amount of spending on the research and development is also very less. So these uh, things you can point out in the issues. And uh, when you come to the way forward, even though it is not asked in the question, you will definitely have to write at least two, three lines of conclusion. So in this, you can again quote some committee. For instance, there was TSR Subramaniam committee. So, uh, and then you can quote some reforms by saying we need to have a better uh, a reformed regulator for the higher educational institution. So for which the UGC Act needs to be amended. Then whatever grants are being provided to the universities, they must be linked to the performance of these universities then we have to increase our funding so as to be able to uh, create the world-class universities or the institutions of eminence so this program by the government is also a step in the right direction uh, for making institutions of eminence in india so all of these things uh, you can write by some of the recommendations of these committees and you can conclude your answer so today's question is uh, discussed environmental challenges arising from anthropogenic activities is a 10 mark question for 150 marks so do write the answer that's it for today thank you